The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. This is one of the most magical places along the entirety of the Gulf. It's a sportsman's paradise and something that every outdoors enthusiast can enjoy. The hide, the horns, preserving the memories, just preserving that beauty so that we get to see it all the time. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series has been on the air for 30 years. So what does it take to make an episode? I've got a lot to tell you. outside for 30 years. This is one of the last great habitats along the Texas coast. It was a ranch of many seasons. It will be preserved forever now. I never get tired of coming here. You don't see a lot of native coastal prairie anymore. Yeah, the powder horn, you know, the name is just so evocative and the place lives up to it, you know, from the sprawling live oaks to the miles of frontage along Matagorda Bay and the bountiful fish and game and water birds and waterfowl and redfish and trout. It's just absolutely magical. It's a sportsman's paradise and something that every outdoors enthusiast can enjoy. You know, people care passionately about their coast um, and they want to see it conserved, but they also want to have access to it. And so as we think about conserving what makes our coastal heritage and lands and waters so special, but also being able to provide managed access for fishing and hunting and canoeing and kayaking and bird watching and hiking and nature viewing is just a, an extraordinary opportunity. And the Powderhorn offers that like no other. The Powderhorn Ranch has been the dream of the conservation community for almost a quarter of a century. And everybody has recognized its scale, its incredible ecological integrity and biological uniqueness. And really fish and wildlife biologists have thought of it as one of the last great places along the coast. And this adds to a big network and complex of lands that are already protected for conservation as part of the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge and Matagorda Island. And it's, it's kind of the hole in the donut. What a rich history that the Powderhorn provides in our state, really from the time of Native Americans that were hunting and fishing and living on the banks of Matagorda Bay, all the way up to the earliest European settlers that came ashore in and around this area, to uh, the German settlers that came by there and landed the historic ports that were established near there, and of course the ranching heritage in the area and the Denman family that ranched Powderhorn for almost a century. My husband's family, his grandfather, Judge Denman, 
sat on the Supreme Court of Texas. He bought the Powderhorn Ranch with his son, Leroy Denman. So it came into the hands of my husband, Leroy Denman Jr., to ranch for some 65 years. And it was simply a love affair to encourage and to grow and to make better what he had been asked to oversee. How grateful Leroy would be if he were alive today. He wanted very much to pass it on, leaving land for the future. We've been ranching since the 80s, and we came to the Powderhorn about 12 years ago. What a, what a treasure. If you love your job, it's not work. And that's the way we feel about the ranch. Great place to raise kids and, and a family. Well, you always worry about development of a place like this. And I know from experience, from being here, when people have come to look at it, to uh, build plants and industry on it. And so that was my biggest worry, is, you know, it go to development instead of staying like this. You know, it's just preserving what's here. I think that's a, just a win for everyone. So we're trying to restore this property back to a native prairie state. This should be a tall grass prairie that's going to have a diverse plant community. And in turn, that plant community is going to support a diverse uh, bird community. Powderhorn is a unique place because it hasn't been divided into smaller ranches. It's still an intact tract of native tall grass prairie. There's less than 5% of tall grass prairie left in the United States. A lot of the areas are built up in homes, uh, industry, farmland, rangeland, and you don't see a lot of just open native grassland. Obviously this running live oak is too thick for animals to utilize. In the absence of fire, the running live oak has grown up into these thick moths. Our intent is to use herbicide and prescribed fire to knock it back and get back to a native prairie state. So birds are gonna be the main animal that's gonna benefit from this restoration. Uh, a lot of imperiled birds, like grassland nesting birds, but also uh, Oplomato falcons and whooping cranes are going to benefit from this restoration. The majority of this property is going to be a wildlife management area where we'll be able to do habitat management, have public hunts, but the, the, most of the time it's going to be an outdoor research laboratory. Uh, the state park is going to cater more towards uh, the daily use visitors that come out, uh, maybe camp. There will be access to shoreline fishing, uh, walking trails, hiking trails, biking trails. Right now, we are designing research studies, uh, setting up public hunt programs, and getting, overall getting ready to where the public can come out and enjoy this property. We couldn't have done the Paderhorn Ranch project without the Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation. This is a very entrepreneurial, innovative, public-private partnership. Really the, the precedent for the future. And certainly a public entity couldn't do this by itself. Thanks to the extraordinary efforts of the Parks and Wildlife Foundation who put together this public-private partnership with huge seed funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundations, the Nature Conservancy and the Conservation Fund who were able to help put the deal together and many donations from a wide variety of donors, big and small, we were able to see this dream realized. I sang Oh, I thank the Texas Parks and Wildlife and those private sector donors that have been so gracious to make this possible.
We have a lot of work to do ahead of us, but it's good work, it's rewarding work, and it's gonna help chart the course for what undoubtedly is gonna be one of the most iconic and flagship properties within the state's public land system. These are the proverbial trees that we're planting so that somebody else can enjoy their shade. Uh, and if we wouldn't take these kind of risks, we wouldn't have any more state parks for our growing public to enjoy. Paderhorn is going to be one of those places that we look back on for generations to come, and we're going to thank goodness that we had the courage and the foresight to acquire this place. It's another utopian day in Utopia, which is an actual place in the hill country west of San Antonio. Kind of a small community, a lot of ranching, a lot of hunting business, a lot of retired folks. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Every week, Lee Beverly serves a community of churchgoers. My main job as the pastor here at the Utopia Baptist Church and that's my full-time occupation. But outside of worship, the Reverend Beverly provides another service in this community. My hobby is taxidermy. When his focus is not saving souls, it's saving skins as lasting mementos of hunting and fishing trips. It's not a calling, I don't think, but I think it's part of a gift that God has given me, an eye to see the nature of animals and and try to take something that is lifeless and make it look lifelike, look real. I'm gonna put a little glue on here. I know I'm not the best taxidermist in the world by a long shot, but I know I'm not the worst neither. <laughs> you know, every taxidermist is different. A look around the Beverly home shows just how much Lee has learned about the art of taxidermy. The first thing I ever mounted was a squirrel. And I used a paper towel roll and two black marbles for the eyes. Ended up about that long. <laughs> and so it's been a conversation piece. My sister still has it. I grew up, my dad was a hunter, and his dad was a hunter. Kind of a family thing. So we did it all of our life. Because I love nature, I love the outdoors. Well, let's not waste something that's been harvested, it's just preserving that beauty so that we get to see it all the time. Hide the horns, preserving the memories. Let's see where we're at. You know, I've been asked, you know, well, is that a godly thing or not to do? James 1.22. We're to be doers of the word. In Genesis chapter 2, God told man to take care of the earth. Harvesting an animal and knowing the numbers that we can harvest is part of conservation. I'm usually out here by myself, and yeah, it's a good quiet time. Sometimes I'll have to stop and write down some sermon thoughts. While the Reverend's hobby seems at peace with his faith, there is one kind of taxidermy he will not touch. I've had people ask me to do a cat and, and a poodle, and I said, no way, <laughs> no pets. This is a goose. These are wings for a turkey. Oh, that's my jackalope. Though the craft has evolved with creativity and available supplies. All kind of sizes. White-tailed deer. Fish eyes. Some things have not changed. Fixing to do a quail. It teaches you patience. Already skinned it out. Put the eyes in it, and then I've got wires in the legs, and that'll help make him stand up. That's one of the reasons why I picked up taxidermy as a kid, to learn patience. set them in here and have them standing up now. And then it's just a, 
a matter of getting all the feathers in the right place. Preserved with care, a mount like this quail can last a lifetime. As long as they don't have a cat in the house, it still has bird scent. <laughs> and it still looks like a bird. So I tell everyone now, if you've got cats at home, beware. Although most work is for clients, the Beverly's keep their own mounted memories. Whenever someone goes hunting and they harvest their animal. Got a bunch in here. That's an experience that they have for the rest of their life. Some of mine and the kids. Uh, this is my son's first deer. When they take that home, put Seven it on their wall, old. every time they walk by, they look at that. So all those memories come back. Every hunt with the dad or the sons or even my daughter, uh, she's a hunter too. They all have some kind of a special meaning behind every one of them. So I come in here every once in a while and just look around and remember all the great memories we've had. Probably one of the biggest problems with the world today is families don't spend time together. Learning to We do a lot of things together, and because of that, we have good communication. However you may define utopia, as a place of faith or a community of friends and family, as a place where work brings joy, or maybe just a place where the sky is blue and the water runs clear. Lee Beverly seems to have found his utopia, and it's a real place in the Texas Hill Country. All I thought Pinellas was was like camping and the little river part. I did not know this place was here at all. Mountain biking in general is becoming a more popular pursuit. The Texas Hill Country is quickly becoming a mountain biking and cycling mecca. Here at Perdinalis Falls, we have a great deal of trails that can accommodate all skill levels of mountain biking. Watch out for that bump. More of our campers are showing up with mountain bikes. Particularly on weekends, we get a lot of mountain bikers staying in the park and training on our trails in the park. Wait for us, wait for us. Right now, it seems like it's fairly unknown for bikers. In fact, I don't know if we've seen anyone on bike. We have probably eight miles of one-lane dirt road trails that will accommodate your basic skill level mountain bikers. It's a good way to get out and see the park. This is nice right through here. We have some secondary trails that all together encompass about 20 miles of, of mountain biking trails. Wolf Mountain Trail is our most popular mountain biking trail and it provides a combination of single track and wider Jeep road type terrain. It can range from easy, flatter type terrain to some pretty significant hills that will provide a good challenge to any skill level. Hey, I kind of took a look at it thinking maybe. <laughs> yeah. No way, it was like, it was like, come to a stop, get off your bike and walk. <laughs> Looking forward to um, getting to ride through the flat area <laughs> and through the flowers. It is really pretty. Uh, you know, there, there's places where it's a nice almost meadow with just going through uh, flowers, kind of like here. And then there's places that are nice and shady with all the cedar trees, and there's even places that look kind of like mini ravines. We get groups of all types out here. A lot of it's just families looking to escape and get out and enjoy nature on their bikes and get a little exercise. We also get your hardcore mountain bikers that come in here and uh, want to cover 20 miles in two hours, and they're hitting the trail hard. We can uh, certainly accommodate any interest in mountain biking here. Drafting. Drafting. <laughs>
great. Yeah, it's beautiful. I'm Jeffrey. I'm the newest producer for the Texas Parks and Wildlife television series, and I've got a lot to tell you. I'm one of over 30 people who have contributed to the show over the years. I replaced Ron, who was here for 23 years before he retired. The Texas Parks and Wildlife television series has been on the air for 30 years. That means the show is just a few months older than I am. We make videos about hunting, fishing, conservation, wildlife management, hiking, camping, sports, and all things outdoor life. Texas Parks and Wildlife airs on PBS stations across Texas and a few stations in other states all year round. We produce 13 hours of video every year with just a handful of people. Bruce, the executive producer, Don, the series producer, Abe and Alan, dedicated story producers, with help from technical supervisor and producer Kyle, news producer Karen, social media producer Whitney, and now me, I replaced Ron. The show is produced here at the Texas Parks and Wildlife Headquarters Complex in Austin, Texas. Nestled in between the legal division, human resources, and IT, across the hall from the cafeteria, we've got our own little hole known as the pit. We've got three editing workstations, well four, but one is in a noisy tape room that no one ever wants to use, a voiceover booth, a room full of video production equipment and other outdoor gear, and a big library of tapes. There are lots and lots of videotapes. So what does it take to make an episode? Well first, we all keep in touch with what's happening in all the divisions of Parks and Wildlife. When an interesting story comes up, we go into pre-production mode, making phone calls, working out itineraries, scheduling interviews, printing maps, reserving equipment and vehicles. Before a big shoot, we pack up all the gear in a truck and drive. And drive. And drive. Texas is really big. Once we get to a state park, or a state natural area, or wildlife management area, or anywhere Parks and Wildlife staff are working, we go into action. Most of these productions are a one-man operation. It takes a lot of work just to get a camera to a shooting location, with lots of driving, off-roading, and hiking. We have to find that elusive owl, or bobcat, or fish, and actually get a good shot of it. We also interview people and do our best to make them look eloquent on camera. Huh? Once we get back, we hole up in a darkened editing suite and start crunching. It's tedious, it's frustrating, uh, the computer crashes a lot, no. but eventually we make it out with a finished story and hand it off to Don, who compiles them into a half hour TV show, which gets delivered to your local PBS station, or PBS Online, or YouTube. Actually, there are a lot of ways to see the show now. After the show is delivered and aired and uploaded, it goes back here to the tape library. And this library is an extensive visual history of the state of Texas. From ancient dinosaurs, prehistoric man, and Texas history, to current outdoor recreation, ecological and biological study, conservation, and wildlife management. These aren't arcane government reports. These are all the records from Parks and Wildlife Department distilled into a format that everyday people can understand. Whether the future is on TV or on the internet, broadcast or downloaded, I'm proud to contribute to this ongoing legacy for the people of the state of Texas. Here's to 30 more years of Texas Parks and Wildlife.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.